Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIIE Nuclear Chapter webinar on fiber optic sensors for nuclear reactors and Atlas CERN detectors. Before we start, a few web questions. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SIIE YouTube channel, SIIE TV, under the Nuclear Chapter playlist. This channel is updated regularly and you'll find a registration link in the chat box. Please register so you can get notes. It's free. A certificate of attendance will be issued for this webinar. I am uh, Minx Abrabas, producer of the webinar, standing in for Prof. David Nichols. Just a bit of a background on the fiber optic sensors on this topic. Optical fibers have found extensive applications across various industries because of their unique optical transmission qualities. This talk highlights the diverse applications of optical fibers in multiple sectors, focusing on the importance in nuclear reactor facilities and Atlas CERN detectors. Optical fibers have emerged as essential components for radiation resistant sensing systems in nuclear reactors. Their ability to withstand harsh environments such as extreme temperatures and ionizing radiation, makes them ideal candidates for real-time online in-core monitoring of critical parameters within the nuclear reactor. Optical fibers can provide reliable continuous data on temperature, pressure, water level sensing, and radiation levels, enhancing the safety and operation efficiency of the nuclear reactor. Additionally, Using optical fibers in the Atlas CERN detectors for monitoring environmental parameters demonstrates the importance in high energy physics research. The high radiation levels produced by the accelerator's operation can seriously impair the effectiveness of conventional sensors. This necessitates the usage and application of highly robust sensor equipment. Our UJ group at CERN is in the advanced stages of developing and deploying the FOS technology for monitoring temperature, dose, and relative humidity in the Atlas inner detector. Another intriguing feature of optical fiber sensors is the ability to perform distributed measurements, a unique feature not in conventional sensing technologies. On this note, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker this morning, Dr. Bongani Makabuka, who's a research fellow at the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Makabuka is a research fellow within the Department of Mechanical Engineering Science at the University of Johannesburg. His research interests primarily revolve around nuclear physics, nuclear energy, computational physics, and applied innovation physics. With a solid academic background, Dr. Makabuka earned his PhD in nuclear physics in 2018 from the University of Western Cape, solidifying his expertise in the field. I'll hand you over to Bongani. Bongani, you can unmute yourself, please. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Miss. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, is uh, is it visible on, on your side, my presentation? Yes, it is. Please, please proceed. Okay. okay, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everybody who has managed to come through to this webinar. Um, uh, I will be presenting on the fiber optic sensors uh, that we are developing for application to nuclear reactors. Uh, this is a technology transfer we are doing from CERN and uh, innovation, uh, transferring it from CERN to UJ. My name is Bongani, as already indicated. Uh, in this project, uh, uh, it's a wide range of um, stakeholders that we are working with. Um, We've got um, NEXA, uh, which is providing us the radiation fa uh, uh, facilities. And we've got ESCOM, uh, which has got uh, the nuclear power station, uh, where we intend ultimately, once we have developed the technology, to deploy uh, it at uh, 
and they are also, of course, uh, helping us to provide a, a fun, fu funding, a bit of funding also. And then, of course, they send where part of our group is working at CERN and they've done a bit of, uh, uh, of this technology development there, but uh, in a different setup. And that will come through later with uh, my colleague here, Connor. I'm trying to scroll through. Okay, thank you, sorry for that. Okay. Uh, I am just uh, in here showing the different energy sources. Uh, as we would know, we've got coal, uh, natural gas, solar, and and any and other uh, forms of uh, energy sources. Just to show uh, uh, the one which has got uh, the leakiness of the emissions of greenhouse gas per kilowatt of hour of energy produced. And you could see uh, in the slide uh, that uh, solar, nuclear, and wind are, you know, forming that group of uh, technologies which, prov which provide the cleanest form of uh, energy sources. So, in a way, if 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 you want uh, to transition to uh, cleaner sources of energy, you cannot be able to take away nuclear as as one of those. Okay, but of course, on top of that, there's also what we call energy availability factor. And uh, nuclear technology stands out uh, amongst all of the different types of energy sources that we have. Looking at there at 92, followed by coal and then natural gas. And your solar and wind are standing very low there. So in a way, you cannot be able to run away from the fact that you need nuclear as cause a base uh, load uh, provi provision uh, of energy. So it, it has to be part and parcel of, of this transition. Okay, so I'm just listing here some of the uh, facts on nuclear energy, such as, for example, just one uranium pellet, which is roughly the size of uh, the tip of an adult uh, little finger. It contains the same amount uh, of energy as, as, as 481 cubic meter of, of natural gas which is almost a ton of, of coal uh, that you need. So in a way, uh, you can see that just a small amount of uh, uh, the fuel, uh, nuclear fuel, you can be able to produce quite extensively, extensive amount of energy uh, uh, from, from nuclear. And, and of course, your, your nuclear, you can be able to operate it uh, for 24 hours a day and a week to, to uh, energy availability factor. So in a way, all it demonstrates uh, this, this is that uh, you need nuclear and uh, nuclear is, is necessary as part of the complement of your, of your transition to uh, cleaner uh, energy forms. And there's, it's about 10% of the world's electricity it comes from nuclear power plants, as we know. And, and nuclear energy is being used in, in more than 30 countries around the world. And even uh, it powers our Mars uh, rovers in, 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 in Mars, yeah, of course. And I'm just showing some of the countries which are leading in the uh, largest producers of nuclear power, which are your US, uh, your uh, France, and, 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 and Japan. These are the leading countries in terms of production of, of, of nuclear energy. Now the question is, what are uh, optical fibers? Uh, optical fibers are mainly made up of glass, as you know, or sometimes they could be made even of, of plastic. Uh, but uh, importantly, they are to very light in, in along the length of, of the fiber. And we understand uh, fibers uh, mainly in, in, in fiber optic communication in our telecommunication space, which is um, which can transmit signals over long distances and, and at higher bandwidths. So that's the advantage of, of these fibers. And I'm just showing here <clears throat> the structure of the fiber. It's just a small cable uh, at about 250 uh, micrometers at its uh, largest diameter. And it's mainly made up of these three main structures. You've got the core at the center. Uh, uh, this is the light transmission area of the fiber. Uh, it's about nine micrometers in terms of its size. More light, uh, sorry, the larger the core, more light uh, that uh, the more light that will be transmitted into the fiber. 
And, and then from there, you can have uh, on top of the core, you can have your cladding. Your cladding, normally it would be, it, 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 it would be uh, similar to your core, but then now it's doped. You normally would put some doping because you want to have it to have a different uh, refractive index to the core so that you can be able to contain light within within the core. And then from there, you will have coating. And then your coating are usually made up of multi-layers of plastics, which are applied to preserve the fiber strength and also to absorb the shock and also to provide that extra fiber protection. And fibers, you can have them in two modes. Uh, there's single mode fibers, and then there's uh, multi-mode fibers, depending on, and on the uh, application you want. But generally, the single mode fibers are the ones which are fairly good for transmission of the signals over long distances. And the multi-mode fibers uh, are mainly for short distances. So uh, if you want uh, transmission of the signal uh, over a short period of uh, distance, so it's better to use that one, that type. I'm just showing here in the slide the different applications of the uh, industrial applications of the fiber optic sensors, uh, as you would uh, uh, know, of course, the nuclear reactors, uh, it's one of those, and uh, uh, which is what in our own case we're interested in. And they are also used in the medical field, uh, of course, and uh, nuclear waste, they, they, they are also find, uh, they find use even in there. And also for uh, structure health monitoring, uh, it could be also in civil engineering structures. It, it's quite a wide range of, of, of applications that uh, these fibers uh, are, are used in. Okay, now in our own instance, as I've already indicated, we want to apply them in, in the nuclear reactors and we want to develop them for, for, for measurement of a wide range of, of, of nuclear reactor parameters, which are very critical and very necessary for the operation of the reactor, such as, for an example, your temperature, your water level sensing, or your dose measurement. We must be able to separate what we call total, total ionizing uh, a dose from what we call displacement damage dose, okay? So in our own case, we want to apply, and we want to apply in a, a Initially, with what we have at Kubek, in our own instance, uh, your French uh, type of reactors, which are your pressurized water reactor, uh, reactors, what we have. So we want to see if we can be able to apply uh, them in, in that kind of a setup, okay? I'm just showing here uh, your classification of a nuclear environment. And, and basically, as, as you would know that the presence of what ionizing radiation there, it can make the nuclear facility extremely hazardous, uh, especially to the uh, operators. Uh, but of course, not only to the operators, but it's also very hazardous to the devices and also the systems themselves. Your so electronic devices, when they are put inside there, they can be quickly uh, uh, um, damaged. Uh, yes. So that's why in this regard, we are looking at the optic fibers, which can be able to withstand such high radiation environments uh, as you would have inside uh, that is inside a reactor, okay? I'm just showing here your typical radiation quantities for a pressurized uh, water uh, reactor environment. You, you will have your in-core uh, 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 area, which is uh, inside the reactor itself. And then you just, I'm just showing there your neutron flux, in other words, levels of, of, of your, of your neutrons there. Before your thermal neutrons, you're looking at 10 to the power 12 between the range of 10 to the 12 and 12 to 10 to the 14. And then your fast neutrons are in the range of 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 14. And your gamma dose normally is in the range of 10 to the power three and 10 to the seven. That is inside the reactor core. It makes it very hostile, that environment, such that your uh, conventional uh, electric, electric uh, uh, sensors can be quickly disabled uh, uh, in that kind of environment. Hence, we want to see or to apply the uh, fibers. And, and I'm just comparing in the case of a, that is outside the, uh, the core, in, other, in the containment building, even there, the environment is still very harsh. Your normal operation does there, uh, it ranges in the, I mean, sorry, it, it, it can pick up to about 10 to the fifth uh, uh, over a period of uh, 40 years operation. And uh, under accidental conditions, your dose can pick up up to uh, mega three uh, um, 
range, which is quite deadly for, 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 for electronic components in that regard. Now the question is, what do we currently have in the nuclear reactors, what is being used vis-a-vis what we want to provide, that is your fiber optic sensors. Currently, you've got what we call platinum temperature diodes as just one of the sensors which are being used for temperature sensing in this case. And normally these are inserted on monthly intervals uh, over a short period of uh, uh, interval, okay? And at times you need uh, needing the reactor to be shut down during the process of, of measurement. And the reactor has got no such internal sensors apart from this. So you don't have permanent sensors which are there, which can continuously provide your operators with the, uh, the data, which is quite fairly not the best way to operate uh, in that regard. But of course, you also have your nuclear fission chambers, which are used for dose measurement. And these are also inserted on monthly intervals for a short period of time. And the reactor has got no such sensors apart from this, in other words, being permanently there. Now the question is with fiber optic sensors, what can it provide compared to what we have? Your fiber optic sensors will be able to provide instant real time and online, and also can have a 3D mapping of the reactor core without shutting down the nuclear reactor. So you've got a continuous feed of the data to your operators and, and, and it won't be done on a monthly basis as it is the case with the traditional sensors. With the force, we'll be able to innovate so that we can be able to measure uh, your total ionizing dose from your uh, displacement uh, dose, uh, which is very important in a nuclear reactor. Now, this is a project which is uh, actually, we've already started here at UJ, and uh, basically we are still at the early stages of the project, and we intend to do this project in sort of uh, this layout, which I've just shown here in these milestones. Firstly, you have to do some what we call simulation calculations or preparatory calculations, which basically are your simulations. You need to be able to determine what is the composition of your fiber. You must be able to test if these fibers won't in use uh, toxic or potential dangerous uh, 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 um, uh, nuclides uh, 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 inside the nuclear reactor. You don't want that kind of thing. So we use our SMCNP and FISPET and also Gen4 to do such simulations, just to do safety calculations before we can be able to deploy these fibers. And the other phase or milestone that we'll be able to do with this is uh, first to characterize these fibers, look at the structure, that is what we call non-instrumented force irradiations. In this instance, we take just a small sample of the fiber, we put it in a capsule, and then we irradiate it. And then we then look at, uh, compare what is its state before it was irradiated and what will be its state after, in other words, post irradiation. And then, of course, part of this uh, phase will also involve uh, the design of irradiation rig, uh, which is quite significant for a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor is quite a very controlled environment. You cannot just insert anything. So hence, we need to have this um, um, sort of production of a, a, a radiation rig, which will be used for, for irradiation, okay? And then, of course, uh, there is also a process of uh, licensing, which will, of course, involve NNR, which is our national nuclear reg regulator in this instance. So in that milestone, that's what we intend to, to be doing. We have not yet uh, done that as yet. And then once we have done that, the next phase would be what we call instrumented um, force irradiation, where now in this case, your fiber will be connected to an interrogator, an external interrogator, in other words, so that you can be able to probe for whatever parameter that you are trying to measure within uh, the, uh, the, the reactor itself, okay? So, but of course, there is also the design of the, sorry, the irradiation rig design, that work will still continue at this milestone, and then also the issue of licensing. And, and then, of course, the other thing we need to develop is what we call a readout system, uh, so that, uh, yeah, that, and, and all, of course, development of an IoT processing system, which will be uh, for the operators in this, in this regard. This is how we intend to structure uh, going forward. So as I've already indicated, we've done a bit, a little bit of uh, some work. Um, we got some fibers, we did some irradiation, first round of irradiation tests. 
were carried out on randomly chosen samples to determine uh, if there are any physical changes or mechanical changes in, in, the, in the fiber uh, as you vary your dose level within the fiber. We just took in this instance, that small samples of seven centimeter long, and they were put in this airtight capsule and they were placed in the, in the, in the reactor core at, at Safari at Nexa in this instance. These are the fibers we, have just, we chose in this instance, but as I, as I did indicate, this set of fibers was picked with no specific regard to any preference. In other words, it may as well happen that what we chose was not necessarily fit for what we intend to do, but it was just, uh, just to see how you know, the systems will you know, work with this. But now we're in the process of acquiring the right fibers. We'll then also read to some of the stuff that we did in this instance, okay? This is just showing uh, the simulation studies which were done on the fibers that I've just indicated previously. They look at the using your MCMP. Uh, this was the work which was done at Nexa. So they look at the composition of the fiber uh, initially. And also they look at also what we call nuclide inventory after you have irrigated these fibers after 28 days uh, of irrigation. And what we picked, which is comforting in this instance, is that we don't induce uh, uh, nuclides which are potentially hostile and potentially dangerous or sort of could cause long-term instabilities within the reactor. So in a way, which it was a good uh, a test that we have done and, and yeah, uh, given us a, a thumbs up in that regard. This is just showing the results as we had. We irradiated uh, these fibers uh, uh, for 21 days up to that uh, uh, 1.18 times 10 to the power 21, a neutron per centimeter square uh, fluence, total fluence. And what we realized in this case, we had three of these fibers. The two of them were coated, it was the acrylate, and the other one was the omosa. These two, which are coated in this regard, what we saw or what came out was that they came out brittle after irradiation and were breaking down. And then the other one, which was the naked fiber, in other words, it, this one had no coat. It came out uh, with, 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 without much of problems uh, compared to the, uh, the other ones, the coated ones. Uh, so, but we're still carrying some tests also on, on this fiber. We still have to do the XRD analysis just to look at the structure, what structural changes have happened. So this is just the phase of characterizing our fibers before we do um, uh, uh, an external interrogation or we connect to an external interrogator so that we can probe whatever parameter that we want inside, okay? Now, let me just come to the working principle of the optical fibers. Uh, there is two modes within which you can use these fibers. You can use them in a what we call discrete mode. Oh, yes, it, it, it's supposed to be discrete mode and also distributed also, sorry, it's me. Discrete mode or in a distributed mode, okay? In the discrete mode, then in that case, you will use what we call fiber break grating or uh, long period uh, uh, gratings. These are sensors which you will write on the fiber. I will just talk about them in the next slide in detail. And then the distributed mode, uh, which is the other mode which you can use this fiber in, is what is when we use now uh, a doped fiber. And in this case, you have to use it with an optical time domain spectrometer. So in this instance, the fiber itself is used as a sensor. You don't have to uh, in, inscribe an FBG or a sensor like as it is with the case of, of, of an FBG. So here, the fiber itself is a sensor and you use it with an optical time domain spectrometer. I will just talk about it in the next slides in detail. So, now, this is the optical fiber break rating sensor. As I've already said, the FBG, you've got to write it on the, on the fiber. It's just the periodical modulation of the refractive index along the fiber formed by exposing uh, the fiber to intense optical interference pattern. And, and you express your break wavelength in terms of the product of the refractive index, effective refractive index, and, 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 and the period it gives you the break. In other words, basically your FBG, it acts like an, what we call an optical uh, filter. It will filter, the filtering device that will reflect light on a specific wavelength, okay? So you've got a broad spectrum of light which you put into your, into your fiber. 
and a specific wavelength in that fiber will be reflected, okay? So the point here is that once you put it in an environment where you want to measure the specific uh, parameter that you want, you will have a shift in this wavelength. In other words, this uh, specific wavelength, it will shift either, you know, it will move from where it is, yeah. And then from there, you can be able to correlate it to the parameter that you are trying to, to, to extract. So that would be how the optical, uh, what I call fiber break rating, uh, how it operates or how it, how it works. And the other mode within which you can use this is, is uh, when you use what you call a long period rating, in this case, your LPG. Your LPG structure is like similar to FBG. However, the perturbation is, is much more longer and it goes typical from 500 to 500 micrometers. And the length of the grating is usually around uh, two to three centimeters long, okay? And the perturbation allows here for the power coupling from the fundamental guided uh, core mode to a discrete number of forward propagating cladding modes. And each coupling happens at a distinct wavelength where the so-called phase meshing uh, condition is satisfied. So you've got these attenuations of the light that you would have your probe light, and then uh, uh, you will have this uh, uh, attenuation at this specific uh, wa wa wavelength as shown in the picture there. So that would be the LPG, which is also a point sensor or a discrete sensor in this regard. And then the other one which I spoke about is the one which is the distributed mode, uh, in the distributed mode, where in this case you use now the fiber. The fiber itself is, is, um, is, is a sensor, okay? So here the distributed optical fiber radiation sensor, it's a new radiation monitoring technology which uses a doped optical fiber as a sensing unit, okay? And the fibers are usually doped by using boron 10, boron in this instance, and then boron, the material, uh, doping the material with boron increases the effect of radiation damage. You want the damage in the fiber and, and you use that damage uh, uh, to sense the parameter that is uh, of interest. Okay, the boron uh, 10 dude has a high Newton capture cross-section. That's the advantage of, 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 of boron. Okay, so what you have is just showing basically your boron, what happens with the neutrons which are coming from your reactor. They then, uh, 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 you will have the fusion products being produced like your alphas and your lithium. And then these are energetic and can cause damage to your, to your fiber. So as, I, as I'm indicated, indicating that the resultant uh, lithium seven and, and, and alpha products are produced at high, at high, high energetic energy and, and are charged and they cause severe damage to the substrate uh, mat, uh, matrix material embedded in. So in this regard, you use this with an optical time domain reflow meter. The OTDR is the one we use to inject a, a, a high powered optical pass into the optical fiber. And then where you have the damage in the fiber, using what we call time of flight, you can then be able to determine uh, the specific point where the damage was. And then with that damage, you can then be, be able to correlate it to, for example, the neutron dose. You can then be able to say that, oh, there is some uh, 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 increase in neutron dose in that specific area. It is well adapted for radiation detection and dosimetry in large facilities. It allows for online monitoring of cumulated radiation dose over hundreds of meters of spatial resolution down up to, with spatial uh, resolution down up to one meters and the dose resolution down up to 10 or 15 uh, a grade. So that's just one mode and we want to see if we can be able to apply it uh, in, in our own case in nuclear reactors. Here I'm just showing, uh, it's just showing uh, the use of this uh, distributed optical fiber radiation sensor. Uh, and they were using it at, at CERN in this, in this instance. They wanted to see uh, the, 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 the dose uh, around this uh, irradiation room, which is the irradiation room. Uh, this facility is called CHAM. Uh, uh, and here it's just giving the uh, key elements of, 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 of this facility. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a radiation facility with a proton beam of 24 GeV from CERN uh, coming from a proton synchrotron, 
and, and normally they use target material like copper aluminum and, and, and low aluminum, uh, low density aluminum. It has got a movable shield of two by 10 meters concrete and, and two by uh, 10 meters on slab. The irradiation room, uh, it, it, it's, it's roughly seven by five meters in terms of uh, its size. And then these are the types of radiation or the radiation field that you get inside there. So they, they are using this fiber in this, this instance and they've laid out, this is just a 3D uh, a picture of, of this. And then what you see uh, with uh, 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 blue color is just showing how they've laid around the fiber, uh, around this irradiation facility. Okay, sorry. And here is just a 2D uh, map, which shows uh, the levels of radiation. And right at the center there, where it's more red, that's where you've got uh, high radiation, uh, because that's where you've got your, uh, 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 your target, your target area, basically, that's where you have, uh, normally when they are colliding the uh, 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 the protons in this instance with whatever target they, are, they, 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 that's where you normally would have high radiation set. So it's just comparing a case where you've got shielding and also the case where there is no shielding. Okay. Now, basically, here it's just a plot which shows around the facility where you've got uh, high radiation uh, uh, levels. And it's just showing, comparing between the two, in other words, a shielded, uh, a case where there is no shielding and also a case where there's full shielding. And the point here with the slide I'm trying to show is that you can be able to map around the, uh, the room or the facility, you can be able to map the areas where there is uh, 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 levels, high levels of irradiation, you can be able to track that. And then in this slide, we're just comparing uh, uh, the uh, optical fiber sensor dose map and also comparing with uh, uh, simulations using Fluka. Fluka is one of the softwares uh, which is used for simulation of irradiation, especially irradiation. And you can see that there is a, a, a good uh, matching, a, a good match rather, between the what we're able to do experimentally and also what uh, we're able to get from the Fluka simulations. They're able to track each other well, okay? And then now I'm just demonstrating here, uh, part of our group which is doing uh, this work is uh, at CERN and uh, uh, they are doing uh, specifically sensing relative humidity and also temperature in Atlas. That is what my other colleague will talk about, some of the measurements that they are doing. So this is a technology transfer in that regard from there, and we are trying to apply it in our own case uh, in nuclear reactors, okay? Now I'm just here comparing what are the advantages of these uh, optic fibers, uh, and also what are the uh, disadvantages. Uh, uh, and one of them is, is, is the fact that the nice thing with these optic fibers, optical fibers is that they are immune to electromagnetic interference, which is quite a very good uh, thing. And also they are intrinsically safe and you don't have to power them and, and they're passive. And you can also multiplex, in other words, you can have many uh, measurement points along the fiber uh, to measure or to extract the parameter that you are interested in. And then there's low amount of uh, generated nuclear waste uh, and, and which we have seen in, in terms of our, our simulations also. And there's also high potential for remote sensing, which is quite very good. You can be able to deploy them remotely. And you do not uh, contain their surround, do not contaminate their surroundings and are not subject to corrosion. So those are some of the, just a few uh, of the uh, uh, important things about these fibers. Uh, what is, uh, what are the drawbacks of the fiber uh, optic, optics? There is no history of industrial use in, in a nuclear environment. So that's such a challenge that we have got to face it. And also unestablished long-term reliability. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a new technology, so it still has to be tested. And it needs special equipment to work with. For example, you need your optical time domain photometer, your silicon, sorry, your, your SI-255 instrument, so which are a specialized equipment in that regard. And also the cost associated with implementing the new technology. And, and of, of course, the maintenance staff is untrained on, on the use of, of, of this technology. Now, uh, I'm just illustrating here, uh, how do we uh, envisage to uh, the setup at OVEC? 
uh, our pressurized water reactor, which is a three meter by three meter uh, reactor core facility. This is just an illustration, a whiteboard a picture of, of Kobeck core, which has it. The nice thing with it is that it has got already inbuilt 20 blind tubes, which go through into the pressure vessels. Uh, and, and also, uh, so we don't have to do a lot of retrofitting if we are to insert There's already an uh, existing access points that we can be able to use for deployment of, of, of the fibers, which is what is good. Uh, then there is a manifold, as it is shown in the, in, the, in the rough sketch I've shown there, that can approach each tube. Uh, in turn and connect to, uh, to the tube so that you can send up a, a fiber optic sensor into it. There is also an emergency clip. Uh, you've got an emergency clip on the tube in case there is a safety issue. Uh, the other end of the manifold penetrates the shielding so that the sensor has about five meters long for the inco and plus irradiation. So you can extend beyond uh, the, what you call, uh, uh, sorry, the, the containment building, so that you can be able to take data outside remotely. We could easily insert a, a pilot experiment sensor line as a test in one tube with very little overhead, as I've indicated. We expect we should be able to easily get the regulatory clearance due to a previous similar test which were done and, and also granted in, in, in regard to this. Just to come to conclusion, uh, just to summarize uh, the advantages of this force, force development at, at UJ, NEXA, and also ESCOM, uh, together with these institutions. Uh, one is enhanced nuclear reactor safety. That's one of the main important things that we will be able to derive that. Our primary goal is to enhance the safety of the nuclear reactors, which are vital sources of clean dispatchable energy to the grid. And to achieve this, achieve this by providing state-of-the-art force technology that offers real-time income monitoring of the critical parameters, uh, such as your temperature, water level, pressure, and, and so on. And yeah, and an and early detection of, of anomalies, uh, uh, which is quite very important for the operators. Uh, improved operational efficiency, we want to optimize operational efficiency of the nuclear reactors. Force can be able to provide real-time data that empowers operators to make informed decisions and also op optimize uh, reactor performance and reduce also uh, the downtime. And also contribute to increase energy generation and, and also, of course, it will lead to cost savings in that regard. Uh, and uh, also thirdly, we want to advance uh, green energy production. First project aligns uh, well with the country's goal to transition towards cleaner and more sustainable energy. And of course, we want to foster innovation and also technology leadership. We aspire to be at the forefront of technology uh, innovation in the field of optical fiber sensors and the application in nuclear reactors. The technology transfer from CERN is, is just demonstrating exactly that. Of course, this will create also economic opportunities which is what we intend to stimulate economic growth by fostering the development of the local company that will manufacture and, man and, and market the nuclear force uh, sensors. Uh, yes, that's where my story ends. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Bongani. Um, I'd like to introduce us now to our next speaker, uh, Tola Mabekula, who is a PhD student from the University of Johannesburg. He completed his BNG mechanical and full uh, mechanical at the University of Johannesburg. He works on several areas at CERN, including dark matter searches using Atlas experimental data and manufacturing of FOS humidity sensors used to monitor the environment inside the ITK, a sub-detector of the Atlas detector. He's proficient in software engineering for the ITK, where they write code to track the trajectory of particles inside the ITK. This code will make use of accelerated computing infrastructure on graphics processing units. He was awarded Best Master Student in the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment. Also, he received the SA CERN Excellency Award for his work during his master's degree. Over to you, Kola. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, the mix uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, mentioned, my name is Kola Mapekula, and I'm a student at the 
uh, I'm, a, I'm a PhD student at the University of Johannesburg. I don't know, can, can you see my screen at the moment? No, we're waiting for you. Yes, there we go. We see um, the end of Bongani's slide. Yes, there we go. There we see yours. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. So I'll be talking about the humidity monitoring technology that's been used at the Atlas Detector, in particular the fiber optic sensors um, that were, uh, uh, my colleague had uh, just spoken about. So just to describe the Atlas experiment, um, it is one of the uh, general purpose experiments at the, the LHC. Uh, it's located on one of the interaction points. Uh, it's a big, was built with the, uh, the intention to find the uh, to find evidence of the Higgs boson and other physics that may deviate from the standard model. So what it basically does is that it takes a snapshot of every collision that occurs at the interaction point, and then the data is stored in, uh, in various data centers around the world. Uh, the Atlas uh, detector consists of, main, uh, of a few sub-detectors, which include the inner detector, the electromagnetic calorimeter, the hadronic calorimeter, and the muon spectrometer. Now, the inner detector, which will be a part of the focus of this talk, is used to detect the direction, momentum, and charge of electrically charged uh, particles. Then you have our electromagnetic and hadronic calorimeters, which are used to measure energy deposits of these particles. And then finally, we have the muon spectrometer, which measure, measures the momentum of muons. Now, uh, um, when considering uh, the design for future de detectors, we need to be cognizant of the fact that the, the components of the detector need to be resistant to radiation damage. Uh, in, in doing this, we need to assess the impact, the, the, we need to as assess the impact of radiation damage on the sensitive parts of the detector, which include sensors that uh, monitor the environment. Now, because we are working inside the inner detector, which is the closest point to, which is closest to the collision point, we would naturally have a, a higher amount of uh, radiation that these sensors would be exposed to. Um, so we need to find solutions for these sensors, for, for sensors that will be resistant to radiation damage. Uh, so uh, possible solutions are currently being studied, uh, being uh, researched for. Uh, where we are looking for uh, radiation hot sensors that will uh, monitor temperature and humidity inside the inner detector. So, uh, but, the, but before we did the, uh, the Atlas experiment used to use uh, exp uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, sensors. And uh, these conventional sensors include uh, this Honeywell sensor which is a uh, an Hello? Hi, we've lost audio there. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Hola? 
Apologies, ladies and gentlemen. We seem to having be having technical issues. Uh, Kola, can you hear me? Bongani, can you hear me? So I was talking about the conventional sensors that are currently being used at the atlas detector, um, which one of one of which is the uh, Honeywell sensor, which is an electric uh, uh, electrical component. Uh, but then the problem with this uh, sensor is that it dies under very quickly under harsh radiation environments. And then we also have the chilled mirror, uh, which uh, extracts air inside from from the um, environment that we are measuring and then determines the dew point temperature of that air. Now, the problem with this uh, 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 the sensor is that it needs many sniffer tubes to go inside uh, the volume that you are uh, uh, measuring, and it, uh, which means that uh, we'll need a, a very high material and space budget. Okay, so, um, so one of the solutions that are currently being investigated at CERN is uh, the use of uh, is the use of fiber optic sensors inside the inner detector, and this is because of their function the because of the, their functionality inside radiation uh, 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 environments with high radiation. Um, so the plot the, the, this plot basically shows the number of papers that have been uh, 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 published. Uh, in the last few decades, uh, which are related to fiber optic sensors. And as you can see that there's, a, there's, there's been an exponential growth in the number of papers that have been published, which uh, goes down to show that there's an inherent need for, the, for fiber optic sensors in, uh, various, in various applications. Uh, just to highlight two of the applications uh, off the top of my head, um, is that uh, we could use our uh, fiber optic sensors in nuclear power plants and uh, in space, space exploration technologies. And this is because these, the, these, these environments are, 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 have uh, extreme conditions where they are extremely cold and they have very high uh, uh, amounts of radiation that uh, electrical uh, components are, are subjected to. And, the advantages of using the, some of the advantages that come with using fiber optic sensors <coughs> include uh, increased immunity to electromagnetic in interference, and this means that uh, data that is being trans that is being transferred uh, transmitted through these optic uh, uh, optic fibers uh, will not be manipulated by the electromagnetic uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum that they are subjected to. And then you have a uh, very high uh, transmission bandwidth uh, where if you are using these sensors in a control system, you have a control system that is embedded in the infrastructure, yeah. then you will have a very fast uh, response time uh, 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 when, when, when receiving the data. Uh, the sensors are very small in size and uh, they have uh, increased cable, uh, cable flexibility. And one of the most important points, actually, when it comes to these fiber optic sensors, is that they have, they offer a very high sensitivity. As you will see later on, um, 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 there, there, there's a direct relationship with the change in uh, period between uh, 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 period gratings inside the, ten the sensor and the change in environment. And the sensitivity is uh, is in the order of 12 picometers in every centimeter. So increasing the use of fiber optic instrumentation in other industries has also resulted in lower costs and a wider range of product availability. Well, the, the one uh, fun fact that I know of is that um, through the use through the use the, the, the use of fiber optic sensors in a, a nuclear reactor uh, for in Cuba, for instance, it is said that the Kubrick reactor would uh, stand to uh, save 150 million rands uh, per year through using this uh, technology. 
so because of the increased popularity and market acceptance of the fiber optic sensors, you naturally will have a, 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 a different variations of uh, 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 the technology being developed. Now, the two uh, main categories of fiber optic sensors include extrinsic and intrinsic uh, uh, sensors. Now, the intrinsic sensors uh, is where the fiber itself is a sensing element. As my colleague mentioned uh, earlier on, this would be, this this would be include the the distributed uh, distributed uh, sensing um, of, uh, of the fiber. And then you have the in extrinsic sensor where the fiber simply transports light to or from the sensing element. And then within the intrinsic uh, intrinsic uh, category, we have fiber grating sensors, which which uh, include your fiber break grating and long 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 uh, period grating or long fiber grating, which will be the topic of our, our, our conversation in in this talk. Um, yeah, so as, as, as I'm as, this is just to go deeper into you, the, the advantages of using uh, these, these sensors is that uh, you can use them in extreme in extreme environments where you have a lot of moist, dust, moisture. You can use them in a vacuum um, in space uh, where you can use them where there's very hot, uh, hot temperatures or cold temperatures or where your infrastructure is subjected to a lot of vibration. And uh, 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 electromagnetic um, uh, interference, and then you also have many sensing modes that are associated with these sensors, which include strain, temperature, humidity, vibration, uh, and radiation dose. And these sensors are very highly customizable, uh, uh, where the, you can customize the sensitivity, the dynamic range of the sensitive the, 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 the sensors, the multiplexing factor. As my uh, 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 colleague mentioned earlier on, uh, the interrogator, which is a very expensive component of uh, the, the sensor, um, the type of functional coating, uh, where you will see later on that uh, we use titanium oxide to make the sensors uh, uh, sensitive to humidity. Uh, we have, a, you can uh, customize the parameters of the grating and the type of treatment of the fiber. And then, well, lastly, the sensors are smart in that uh, <clears throat> they are near microscopic in size and can be embedded into various uh, uh, structures. And they can also be used for, for the fourth industrial revolution, for IR uh, um, uh, 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 applications and Internet of, uh, uh, Internet of Things. Now the disadvantages is that one of one of the disadvantages advantages is uh, um, um, the readout. Um, as you can see, the picture at the bottom left is a uh, this picture of a, a readout component that we use. It's called uh, 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 um, an, an interrogator. Uh, last time I checked, the, the price for this interrogator was around two hundred and fifty thousand euros, which equates to about five five million rands. They are very delicate, um, especially like to handle and also to manufacture. Uh, the experience would be putting together a fiber optic sensing uh, 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 package, and then within the last few steps of putting together the package, the fiber just breaks. Uh, they are very complex and they have very niche applicabilities. So what do these sensors do? I'll start off with the fiber break grating sensors. So in a fiber break grating, the grating inside the core acts as a band stopping filter that lets all, all the uh, wavelengths that are not resonant with the, with the break, break grating inside the core pass through, while the reflected uh, wavelengths that satisfy the break condition are reflected, as you can see in the picture in the middle. Uh, <clears throat> So the wavelengths that satisfy the break condition are described by the equation below, which is uh, where, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the wavelength of the uh, reflected uh, uh, wave is uh, directly proportional to the, 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 the effective, uh, refractive, refractive index of the uh, core and the pitch of the grating. 
now when you, so so what makes these what makes what makes the fiber grad grating um sensor se sensitive to temperature for instance is that if there's an increase in temperature in the environment then you will have a case where the pitch increases as a function of as a function of the uh, the, the, the thermal coefficient of expansion of the core uh, <clears throat> making the wavelength shift making the wavelength shift accordingly uh, so the wavelength shift would then be uh, uh, given by the the, the the equation at the very bottom uh, the dif differential equation which is uh, which is a, a, a function of the temperature shift and then we have uh, the long period fiber grating uh, which couples lights from a guided mode into a photo, forward pro propagated cladding mode where, where the light is lost due to absorption or scattering in the cladding mode. Now the coupling into the cladding modes is, the wave, is wavelength dependent, which means that we can obtain a spectrally selective loss resulting in the wavelength distribution on the other end of the sensor. As you can see in the picture um, on, the, on the top right, where the where the wavelength entering the center is uh, it has a dis different distribution to the one that exits the, sen the sensor. So to make the LPG sensitive to, to humidity, as I mentioned earlier, the fiber is coated with titanium oxide, which is able to ab absorb, uh, absorb uh, environmental moisture. So as it absorbs the moisture, the coating expands thereby also forcing the fiber in that particular portion of the of, of the of the of the fiber to expand and this in turn increases the period between the cladding models or uh, cladding uh, modes which thereby alters the pervading refractive index of the core uh, we have three uh, types of sensors uh, that we use <coughs> that, 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 that can be used uh, these include uh, eczema LPG, which is based on a phenomenon, phenomenon of uh, photosensitivity and allows grating to be written using UV laser source. Uh, these LPGs have been inscribed in photosensitive single mode uh, where they are co-doped with uh, 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 well, boron and ger germanium uh, inside the fiber. And then you have arc induced uh, LPG, which creates a physical periodic deformation of the fiber by means of an electrical discharge while a longitudinal force is applied. And then lastly, you have the femtosecond LPG, which is based on densification of the glass in order to create a periodic variation of the refractive index of the optical fiber. But for our intensive purposes, we use the LPG, the eczema LPG uh, 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 sensor for our package, uh, mainly because it's very easy to, 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 to uh, inscribe the 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 the, 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 the grating on the uh, on the fiber uh, using UV, and it's been found to be one of the cheaper uh, options to use. So the fiber, the 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 the, the, the sensing package that we've uh, we we are currently developing at CERN uh, includes your LPG and then two fiber bread grating uh, sensors, which are spliced, to get, spliced next to each other. Now, the first FPG, uh, um, FPG uh, force sensor is radiation hard and is only sensitive to temperature. The second one is not radiation hard, which makes it sensitive to both temperature and total ionizing uh, radiation dose. And then finally, the LPG sensor is sensitive to radiation dose, temperature, and humidity. Uh, so, yeah, um, so uh, the working principle of this package is that we start, we start off by getting the readings from the radiation hard sensor, which uh, get, where, where we only get uh, temperature readings. And then we use this reading to infer the reading of radiation dose in the radiation soft FPG sensor, and then use the same process in the LPG sensor to infer the, infer the, 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 the value of uh, 
humidity uh, reading of the uh, of the environment. And this is the uh, 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 signal deconvolution algorithm that you use to uh, obtain these parameters. Uh, where <clears throat> we get the value of temperature from the first FPG, which is uh, radiation or hard, uh, and then the total wavelength shift for this sensor is equal to the total wavelength shift due to temperature. And then the second step is that we compensate the temperature effect obtained from the first FPG on the second FPG, where the total wavelength shift is equal to the total wavelength shift due to temperature and the total wavelength shift due to total ionizing uh, dose. And then we, so we, we, we merely just subtract, subtract the value of total wavelength shift due to temperature from, from the total uh, wavelength shift so that we can get the wavelength shift due to wavelength shift due to total ionizing uh, 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 radiation dose, and then we do the same for the LPG sensor, where we compensate the effects of temperature and total ionizing dose on the LPG response and derive the value of relative humidity. So in order to validate, in order to validate uh, uh, this algorithm, we constructed a uh, uh, environmental chamber at CERN, uh, which consists of, uh, of uh, this a flange, uh, a chamber, which, which where we in, where we insert a mixture of uh, humid air and dry air, and we control we control the, the the mixture of humid air and dry air using valves so that we can get an accurate uh, uh, amount of relative humidity. Then <clears throat> this chamber is then enclosed inside an insulating box, and then the temperature is really is is uh, 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 regulated using a uh, 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 um, a chiller which also inserts dry air at dry air into the the climatic chamber um, at, at a particular temperature. And then to validate, to, to, to further validate using a radiation, we sent two samples of the packages to the uh, irradiation facility at CERN, which was subjected to a proton beam, uh, <clears throat> a proton beam uh, for, for five days in order to get a total, ion total dose of uh, uh, one megagray. <clears throat> And then these sensors, the plan is to insert these sensors uh, in various uh, parts of the inner detector, which include the outer pixels, the, 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 the outer pixels section, the inner pixel section, and the outer service volumes assembly. And if, if this project uh, uh, bears fruit and is shown to be successful, then I, my, my, my intuition is that we'll be able to move forward and where where the the, the 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 commercialization partners will be able to 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 have proof that these proof of concept that these uh, uh, fiber optic sensor packages actually work in a high radiation environment. So in conclusion, uh, there are very interesting applications for these fiber optic sensors uh, where they can be used in cold and dry environments, uh, also in radioactive, uh, uh, radioactive environments. Uh, the, the first technology is radiation hard. It has long-term stability and is sufficiently precise. Uh, then uh, the final spending on the system completion, system completion is, uh, is imminent. Uh, we probably will be able to install the sensors inside the inner detector, uh, the, the Atlas experiment, early next year, and then this will be used. This could hopefully be used as a use test case for commercial applications. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much, Gola. Um, I'm encouraging all our attendees, if you have any questions, now's the time for it um, as we're going into our question session. At this moment, I have no questions for our presenters. Um, I'll give it a few minutes. Um, and while we're waiting for the questions, um, I'm just going to run a poll at the moment. Um, 
So I'm going to launch the poll and if you can just give me your input, um, how you learned about the, the webinar, it's just so we can just sharpen our pencils when it comes to the marketing of our content. Um, you welcome to Rosa Bell. While you're posting questions, please. Let's give another 20 seconds for everybody to leave their mark. Great, thank you. Um, seeing that there's no questions to our gentlemen, um, I would like to thank you all for